Business and magic, do they mix? Hi, I'm Sandra from mysterywitchschool.com and if you're new to this channel and you want to learn more about Wicca and witchcraft or you want to be a witch or a Wiccan, hit the subscribe button below so that you don't miss anything. In this video, I'm actually got together with another magical uh, professional called Eric Adish. And Eric also has a YouTube channel under his name, Eric Adish. And he is a magical artificer and a tarot diviner. And we thought we would get together and actually do uh, some interviews of each other because we got talking and we discovered that there's a lot um, out there that people maybe not dis aren't discussing online. And we just thought it would be interesting to pick each other's brains, especially around the topic of being a professional witch or a professional magician out there in the world and having that as our base of income in the world. So I'm going to go across to the interview. It was a wonderful stormy afternoon. So there will be uh, thunderclaps in the background, a lot of darkness as the lights go out and um, a lot of uh, lightning perhaps as well. So do enjoy the interview and I'll see you at the end of it. So welcome Eric to the Mystery Witch School YouTube channel and how are you going? I am really well. Uh, we've had, had a bit of a busy day making some wands and we've got a bit of a storm coming in but yeah busy and good. Great okay so what I'm going to do is ask you a few questions about being a professional witch and being an entrepreneurial witch and your experiences of that and also a few other things about magic and witchcraft that are interesting topics especially for people like ourselves who are in the the broader out there type of community and the whole world gets to see what we're doing and yeah. um so it's interesting to find out what other people are experiencing what people believe and how they practice so my first question to you is, you have an Etsy store, uh, which is ericaddish.etsy.com. Yes. And you describe yourself as a tarot diviner and magical artificer. So would you tell me a bit more about the role of a magical artificer? My work and also a lot of the language that I use are inspired by a gentleman uh, named Rune Emerson. Um, and artificers or smiths um, are magicians who use magic through crafting. Uh, we make objects and imbue them with sort of occult virtue through that construction process. So I have a lot of hands-on work where I am crafting things, where I am doing that ritualized process of creating that with magic and intent. Wow, okay. So you do that a lot with wands? That, that seems yeah. to be your main thing? Yes, <laughs> yeah, my main focus is definitely the wand craft and wand lore. Um, yeah, it's definitely sort of, it wasn't initially going to be the focus of my work, it was going to be the tarot that I sort of had as the basis, but as I entered into this, it's just that the wands have become, you know, very popular and a, a lot of people have loved them, so it sort of became the focus, even though it wasn't originally going to be that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. And you do make some beautiful wands, I've definitely seen some of them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So you seem to be very inspired uh, by the Solomonic work and the grimoire tradition. So how does this tradition inform or influence your witchcraft practices? So my involvement in, in witchcraft is very much based on my involvement in community. Um, I don't know a lot of ceremonial magicians. I do know a couple, um, but for the most part, the, the people who are hosting events or running events, creating spaces are witches. And so my involvement in community is in witchcraft. Um, so I have that Solomonic craft as sort of my basis, um, my point of understanding things from. Uh, but the stuff that I'm actually out there doing is very much witchcraft. Uh, in 2015, though, I really started to look at this from a more academic perspective. 
and started to piece together uh, a lot of things that I didn't see before and in the ways that these grimoire systems have actually influenced uh, you know, Western magic broadly, including sort of Wicca. So I sort of could see that thread, that current uh, being pulled through into what was still being practiced in, in my local communities. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So you've been in your own business for how long? Uh, I've been doing this for 12 months now. Okay, okay. So what inspired you to leave your, because you had a corporate job before this, didn't you? Yes, I did. <laughs> so um, what inspired <laughs> you to leave the corporate world for your own business in magic? I had a lot of issues with the work that I was doing, uh, moral, ethical issues um, about perpetuating sort of money-based economy. Um, I think that as a society, we've sort of moved past the need of money um, and to a point where we could easily supply for everyone everything that they need on those lower rungs of Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, so working for a bank, which is what I was doing, um, it clashed with that very uh, ecocentric pagan philosophy that was about making sure that we don't take more resources from the earth that it can renew and and ensuring that we have that focus on mother earth um you know because this is like <laughs> this is all we've got you know so um for me i i couldn't i couldn't maintain the work that i was doing i couldn't perpetuate that idea anymore and so i had to leave it just so happened that I was lucky enough that I could um, move back into a duplex sort of and half share it with my parents. And, um, you know, I didn't have any debt or anything. So I had a lot of things where I was like, I can take my savings and just invest them into this business, you know, like now or never kind of thing. So I, I, it really just was the right time. Um, it's something I'd sort of fantasized about for years. Uh, but it, yeah, it just, synchronicity I guess just fell into place and that's what happened at that point so mm, yeah so you mentioned to me um, before when we've talked that you started seriously exploring witchcraft and magic back at around 15 years of age mm. so what led you to the magical path oh I've always been interested in magic um, oh the lights just flickered sorry about that <laughs> Um, so yeah, you can hear the, hear the storm the thunder, today. Yeah, I can hear yeah. it. <laughs> um, sorry, <laughs> I'm being distracted now. Um, for me, I've always been interested in magic, um, stories of Merlin and, you know, I think I was about eight years old when the first Harry Potter film came out. Um, so there's always been that sort of magic in pop culture, like Sabrina, the teenage witch and things like this. Um, that were like really influential on my childhood. Uh, so that iconography, <laughs> um, but that iconography has, has always been there and also been, always been constant in my life. And so as a young person, I would play at magic. Um, and then as I grew older and sort of come to understand what magic really was and, and what its role is in the real world, um, I sort of moved from that, that child playing at being a firefighter to actually moving into that and be becoming one, you know? So that's sort of the analogy that I can give as to what was going on in my sort of young brain at that time. And then I, I just happened to be able to find people um, who were willing to take someone on, uh, a training coven who was willing to take someone on at that age, um, which is quite rare. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was really lucky that I found a teacher at that time and did my year and a day with them, my initiation into that eclectic path. And um, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, so I was just thinking that um, a lot of the, those television series that were there seemed to influence a lot of people. And it's, it's, it was a way of putting it out there, um, perhaps where it wouldn't have been before. Um, I certainly remember when I was growing up, we were watching rerun, reruns of Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie. And that's sort of where that sort of thing came for me. 
so yeah. the media seems to be um, a, a vehicle for being able to inspire uh, people mm -hmm. to this path again. Yeah, definitely. When I was in sort of those teen years and I was interacting with this coven, you know, we would watch films like The Craft and Practical Magic and we watched Charmed and all those sort of things. So like the media that I was consuming was only working to reinforce um, that new sort of community that I was engaged in. And, you know, I really built an identity around that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So why Wicca? It's what was there. Mm. Um, at this stage in my life, I have my hand in so many different pots. Mm. Um, but Wicca, like I was saying sort of before, it's like Wicca is what the physical communities I have is made up of mostly. Um, you know, I, I think maybe now we're moving away from that a bit more and more to a general pagan idea um, because there's a lot more information out there now. Um, so, yeah, I think... Wicca is what was there. It was the first thing that I sort of put put my hand to when I was trying to find magic, you know. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like I, I got this. I wonder if I actually have it here. Um, here, this is the <laughs> the book that I picked up from like a news agency. It's like a book of spells, um, and. I sort of read this and it was the first time I'd heard of the goddess or Wicca or anything like this. And um, so I read through it and, and that was what, what was changed it for me. It was like, here's an adult, a grown up um, talking about magic. And I was maybe 11 when I read this book. Um, and, you know, I was like, this is an adult talking about it. So it must be real. Mm. And, <laughs> oh, um, that's a big strike of lightning. Great. Yeah, <laughs> See, the universe agrees. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was yeah that was hugely influential is that that was the first time I sort of uh, touched base with the word Wicca and mm -hmm. knew that magic was intricately tied to spirituality and religion that was the, the start of those ideas for me because up until then it was definitely a, a, a child's idea of magic yeah 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 great things appearing in a puff of smoke you know yeah um I wish <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so Wicca has often been, been portrayed, especially probably in the last couple of decades anyway, as more and more as a religion for, Wic for women. So how do you see the role of the masculine in that divine polarity? I definitely think it has a role. Um, but coming out of Wicca, coming out of, you know, the, the 50s, 60s, um, a lot of the feminist movement um, and like goddess worship and goddess spirituality broadly looking at that sort of historical like it's always ridden with alongside feminism you know mm -hmm. um, and I think those they have to be you know intertwined and I definitely I definitely know there are a lot of people who describe their their spiritual practice I think the reclaiming tradition especially describe their practice as eco-feminist um, you know, that's the basis. So I think there is definitely a role for masculinity, for men um, in Wicca. And it is definitely a fertility focused religion. So it, it is that balance of masculine and feminine. But I think just because of the patriarchy, you know, we need to be leaning more towards that feminine now more than ever, I think, you know, um, to sort of keep those scales in balance yeah to, to so make, I, making up for lost time yeah definitely and i definitely think you can't deny the the amount of queer men uh who are attracted to to wick up mm -hmm. you know these sacred feminine sort of paths as well um you know myself being included in that so you know it has given people who fall outside of the realm of those big five religions um to find spirituality, to find religion uh, in a way that is accepting, you know? And I think that that's one of the, the best things about Wicca is that it does, it has opened up because it certainly wasn't originally. Um, you can read some pretty awful letters from Gerald Gardner where he yeah. talks about how like yeah. they don't want queer men in, the, in their circle. Yep. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> mm. So like see that growth. And I think 
that's what a religion needs. It needs to be able to change and transform to its adherence and its time. And I think that's why Wicca is still so popular because it has managed to do that. It has managed to evolve and grow um, even within those traditional British traditional lineages. You know, I feel that it's still the ideologies have shifted and grown, um, mm. time, you know, and they're now having conversations like dealing with trans issues and, and things like that. And looking at, you know, the initiations of those people and things like that. And, you know, their role in, in that practice. So I think, you know, men have a role, <laughs> um, but I think that there is a reason and a good reason that things are tilted more toward the feminine. Mm, for the for the time being, yeah. What till we bring that feminine yeah. back up to to to, to equal. her yeah. to equal, yeah, power for sure. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> and well, that's also what I like about Wicca, and I can you probably hear the thunder from my end as well. Um, <laughs> the power looks like you've lost your lights. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just looking at my computer battery. Um, so with um, with that whole progressive thing with, with regards to Wicca, that it's not like a lot of the older, more patriarchal religions, the big, you know, as you talk about the big five, that they're kind of stuck and fossilised back in a time when the people who maybe started them or inspired them were being innovative. Um, but because they've, they've sort of stopped and stagnated back and they're caught up in the past, um, there's no progression. And that's probably one of the reasons why some of them are on the decline. That's what I love about Wicca is that it's progressing along with as we progress and as we become more awake and more aware as uh, spiritual beings ourselves. Yeah, I think um, I saw an article recently and I think it was saying that in the US there are more witches than Presbyterians. So, mm. you know, it, <laughs> um, it is definitely um, seeing those, those, those scales shift. And I think as we move, uh, I think Rune Soup, Gordon White, Yes. Um, he's spoken about how um, we're moving away from organized religion, but into a more haunted world. More and more people say they don't believe in God, but they do believe in ghosts. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that mystical, that magical um, element is definitely on the incline and that organized um, sort of patriarchal systems are, are definitely on the decline for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how has witchcraft enhanced your life? In so many ways. <laughs> um, this is a, a really hard question to answer. One thing that I've always been found really important is asking what is magic for? What does it do? And I definitely think that magic is there to improve your life. But magic for magic's sake is not something I'm into. I think using magic to build a business, using magic to master an art form, using magic to better yourself, um, you know, that's what magic's for, is to make us better. It's not, it's not just there for frivolous reasons, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Yeah, I think that's all I can really say. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, yeah, like how it's bettered my life. I mean, it's, it's made me, it's brought me community. It's brought me a sense of identity. It's brought me a sense of belonging, a, a, a life path, you know, um, at those kitchen floor moments, you know, it's been the shining light that gets me through. And when all else fails, it's still there and it's never let me down in that way. So, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So you also teach the craft. Uh, what would you What would you say is the main experience you'd like your students to have as a result of your teaching? A lot of my work is about encouraging uh, experimentation and exploration. Um, quite often, the first thing I'll do when I'm teaching a group is go through sort of the magical models, the psychological model, the spirit model, and the energy model. Um, and I will ask them to sort of identify where they are in that, in those three models and then tell them to pick a different one and occupy that for the day. Um, so I, I like to encourage people to step beyond their own limitations and to explore new things. Um, 
because I feel like when I first started in this stuff, there wasn't enough of that for me. I mm. became a very staunch traditionalist very quickly, um, as my type A personality is sort of want to do. Um, but I, yeah, for me, like in these last few years, especially sort of really leaning into the pop culture stuff and, you know, just getting a bit more experimental, doing things that are maybe, you know, not allowed and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, just breaking the rules and, and trying to test the limits. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I see magic a bit as, as a bit like music. They say that music doesn't have rules, it has conventions. I think that mm. magic is very much about conventions and mm. that it's okay to, to experiment with conventions and break conventions. Yeah, I think though, like music, it is important to learn the conventions first. Yes, because you need you to learn them before you can break them anyway. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and 100%. often you need to learn them in order to know how to break them. Yeah, that's where, that's where that innovation in magic really comes through. Hmm. Um, you know, and I, I've spoken in the past about how I think that people who are using pop culture in their magic and interacting with these modern mythologies, um, they're innovating magic and they're sort of the pioneers of this kind of craft and it's you know so important that we have that encouragement of exploration um you know instead of trying to instead of falling into those traps that other religions do and saying this is how we've done it for 2000 and 2000 years you've got to do it this way mm. um we encourage that exploration that evolution of magic and spirituality i think yeah so would you say that magic is an art? I would say that magic is a craft. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, in that magic makes something. Um, you know, just like, because my wands, you know, they're tools and wand craft is a craft. Um, it's, it's making something. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say that magic is an art, but I, I, I do think that art can be magic, though. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, mm. semantics. <laughs> <laughs> it's often been referred to as, as, as the art of magic or as, you know, as kind yeah. of an art you know, yeah. throughout history. Yeah. I think even Crowley sort of said the science and the art of mm. causing change as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think it was either Alan Moore or Grant Morrison who sort of drew that line for me between magic being an art and a craft. Um, because they're, they're both comic book artists. I just can't remember which one I'm quoting. Um, <laughs> that was sort of their idea is that, you know, you're, you're making something when you do magic, you can use magic to enhance your art. Um, but it's not, yeah, I don't think that it is in and of itself. It's practical. Like magic is yeah, practical. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even um, in Carlos Castaneda's books, um, Don Juan uh, was said shamanism isn't spiritual, it's practical. For those of you who know who Carlos Castaneda is. Um, I do have a book on it. I, I, I have read it, I think, but I can't remember for the life of me what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a bit, there's, it, it's, a good, it's a good read. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of debate about whether Don Juan really existed as a person or whether he was a composite of people or what, what the deal was, but very, very, very good, um, very good read. <laughs> so in Western culture, we've developed a uh, belief that money and spirituality are in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. So as a professional witch who needs mm -hmm. to make money, from your craft um, in order to not just, you know, survive and pay the bills and, and eat, but also to have a life, a decent life, mm. and have freedom and choices. What are your views about making money from, from witchcraft and magic? I would love to be able to do this stuff for people for free. Um, I would love to feel reassured that I was going to maintain a home to live in and food to eat and the things that the necessities that I have. Um, and if they were all covered, I would for sure be doing this stuff for free. Um, but as it is, <laughs> that's not the case. Hmm. Um, so until we saw a global mental shift around supply and demand and resources and money and all those things, um, I need money to live. 
and this is the service that I'm putting my time into and time is what we equate with money in this culture. Yep. So I do expect to be paid for my time. Um, and like I say, you know, that is to only to live, you know, I, I don't know of a lot of witches. I can think of a couple, but not many um, who live that luxurious life. You know, we're, we're a very spiritual people. We're a very modest people. Um, you know, we're not looking for riches. We're looking for, we're looking to help people find fulfillment and, you know, spirituality. Mm. I do think though, like it is definitely like really only a problem here in the West. Um, you don't sort of see it in other spaces. Um, no. I, I have um, some friends who are involved in voodoo, African traditional religions. And in that sort of space, it's totally expected and accepted that money will have to be exchanged. And at times it's quite a large sum of money. You know, we're not just talking about materials and time, but, you know, beyond that as well often quite a lot of those people do put um, that money back into serving their spirits, but or, or their communities. But, you know, there is that, that monetary exchange, but it's understood that that will happen and it's expected that that will happen mm. because that's what that exchange is worth. Um, Rune Emerson, who I sort of spoke about before, I take on his mentality when it comes to spell work. So I charge for my wands, I charge for tarot readings, I charge for the puppets and things, all these things that I make, I charge people for them. Um, but I don't charge for spell work. If I'm, say, doing a love spell for somebody, I might ask them to give me their first love. Um, that could be a teddy bear that they had as a baby or a photo of them playing the first sport they fell in love with or something like that. Um, but they need to give me that symbol of their love to as exchange for that new love. Um, and then that, that photograph or that bear can then go on to be used as a component magical material in other spells as well to put fuel into that new love working that I'm doing for someone. Mm -hmm. So I do expect that exchange there, but it's uh, typically more of a sentimental exchange, not a financial one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what would you then, what would you say is the most challenging aspect about being a professional witch? There's no model or guideline for this stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> I found a lot of useful information by looking at artists, freelance artists, um, and sort of trying to equate my work with theirs. Um, and that's sort of how I came to understand how to run this business and what to do with it. Um, so, you know, but yeah, there's no, there's no framework. There's no model for this stuff. And I think there needs to be more collaboration among people, especially um, to help those who are just coming into this stuff in the financial, like in the business kind of way. Yeah. The startup. Yeah. 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 Mm. So how do people respond to you then when you tell them what you do for a living? Um, <laughs> there's usually like a, a progression of, of questions. So they say, what do you do for work? And I say, I'm a magician. And they go, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then I say, not an illusionist. <laughs> I, I, know, I, oh, I get frantic. Cause I make wands and I do tarot readings. Like, don't, you know, um, but it's like, for me, that's the best moniker. You know, I do magic for a living. Um, I just have to make sure that there's that disclaimer <laughs> with <laughs> what kind of magic I'm talking about. And maybe it's to my own fault. I never spell magic with a K. Um, <laughs> I always just spell it with a C. Um, so maybe it's, you know, partly to my own fault there, but yeah, that's, that's sort of how the conversation happens. But I think in, in the modern day, everybody sort of knows someone who's a witch or has met a witch or been to a psychic or, you know, mm. it's, it's not a strange now and just to be a young person working for myself in that it oh cool you know that's most people's responses yeah yeah things have definitely changed people are a lot more aware of what these things are now and um that's a good thing and it's not as um, scary to tell people what i do now whereas 30 yeah. years ago i wouldn't have i wouldn't have said it <laughs> yeah so over I mean, the last I really lucky, um to have, you know, grown up in a time when, you know, everything was peaches and cream, you know, and mm. the information was available, groups were available, 
the yeah. internet was there mm. you know definitely so mm. lucky to have the past that I do yeah 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 mm. the times are definitely becoming more more hospitable to mm. the craft which is a really good thing so over the last couple of decades magic has become more accessible to people uh, which is a good thing I think and um, we're seeing a lot more information out there also though on the so-called darker side of magic such as cursing and things like that mm. what are your feelings about this kind of accessibility of mag of magic to the general public yeah I mean some things in Freemasonry there's this idea that things aren't important because they're a secret things are secret because they're important mm. and I sort of bring that across to <laughs> um, I bring that across to my ideas about magic um, in that you know pers a person's sort of inner workings or spiritual experiences you know like they don't necessarily need to be out there for the world to see you know it's that keep silent aspect of the the witch's pyramid um, and I mean, in terms of the darker stuff, the quote unquote darker stuff, um, I'm not really worried about that kind of thing. I mean, if, if called for, I will curse, but I tend to think that cursing is more about like releasing negative emotion and just feeling like you're doing something active in a situation where all you can do is be passive. Like when the legal system lets you down, that's when you turn to curse work because there's like nothing else that you can do sort of thing um so i think that there is there is a space for it there is a relevance to it um in the modern world but i mean i don't know that i'm necessarily okay with people going around hexing donald trump or <laughs> all these sorts of things i sort of you know <laughs> talk your head at that don't you <laughs> yeah heard about that yeah <laughs> Same thing happened to Hitler. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is, it is an interest. It's like, there's a lot of room for debate. I think about that topic, um, <clears throat> that you could spend a whole session debating it. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's, I mean, these are all just my opinions. I don't claim to be right about any of this stuff. <laughs> mm, mm. I'll probably change my mind in six months. <laughs> <laughs> so in a world where people are wanting to become more autonomous, and experience religion on a more personal level. What do you think then is the role of the priest or the priestess having in, in the communities? The, the few spirits that I do consider myself a priest of are spirits that I have a certain relationship with. They are spirits that I, that I do or have held public ritual for. Um, for me, the role of a priest or priestess is based on what they're doing in their communities. Um, but I think as well, you know, when you look at other religions, um, not everyone's a priest. And there's a bit of a difference when you look at these sort of neo-pagan religions is that, you know, every person is perceived to be a priest or a priestess. And so if everyone's a priestess, it sort of makes it a moot point. Um, yeah. And I think though that these, you know, the people who, you know, haven't been classically trained, if you'll use that terminology, um, you know, or don't have that mentored relationship or don't have that group experience, they're sort of like that congregation, you know, and the priests and the priestesses are the ones who are doing that that modality of actually like going out there and hosting rituals and teaching people and that sort of thing. And I think that is what the role of it should be. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, and like transmission, there's a transmission that happens during initiation and yeah. it's Quite literally in some cases. Yeah, exactly. That transmission of power. Yeah. Mm. And lineage as well is transmitted mm. as well. So there, there are reasons why initiation ceremonies are and why you have, you know, people who are initiated in certain um, things 
than than others and and why that is important but it, it's sometimes difficult to explain that to people especially in the modern age where everybody wants to be the authority even if they've just picked up their first book mm. I think that's a trap that we can fall into. You know, we read all the 101 books and they all say the same thing. And so we sort of think we know everything mm. because the 102 books don't have witchcraft in the title. That's right. Yeah. Cause it yeah. sort of goes beyond that because that is, it's going more into the mysticism. I feel the 102 stuff. That's when you're starting to really do things that are much more on a deeper level and mm. you're exploring things that are beyond uh, yeah, you, they're beyond that that surface level that you get in the 101, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so as a business owner, you're also a leader because all business owners are leaders in some way. How do you like to lead? That's a hard question. Um, I think the... The best leaders are the people who work and show their work to lead by example. Um, you know, for me, I do, I do what I say that I'm going to do, you know, um, if that means waking up at sunrise to do a consecration, like if I tell you that's what I've done, that's what I've actually done. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there are a lot of charlatans, you know, in this kind of industry, a lot of people who say they do things and don't do things. Um, and so for me, all I can really do is be as authentic as possible, be as open as possible. Um, and a lot of that has had to do with me basing my community experiences on me as a person. Um, I try to build rapport with people, build a relationship with people um, outside of just the products that I make, you know, they're not just a faceless product. Um, the, for me, I think the reason people want them is because they know me and they know what my work ethic is and they know how I am about things. That's why they buy things from me. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of leading, it's by example. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Good. Okay, so where can people go to buy your wands, your oils, and get their tarot readings or anything else that you offer? So, yeah, all of the products and services that I offer are available through the Etsy shop, which is ericaddish.etsy.com. Um, my name's spelled a bit funny, so it's E R Y K A D I S H.etsy.com. Um, but if you search Eric Addish, on Google even, I will come up. So I'm not hard to find. You know, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook and YouTubes and all the, all the things. Okay. So yeah, if anybody searches my name, they'll find me. Excellent. And I'll put a link to your Etsy shop in um, the description field below the video as well. Awesome. People can find you and um, have a look at what you've got to offer with both with the tarot readings and also with the, the wands and the other, mm. other products that you have. Okay, so thank you, Eric, for oh, thank you joining so us much. today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure for me too. It's good to talk to other people. I should do interviews more often. Yeah, okay. despite our, our, our weather, our weather. The and the lights and the thunder, Mercury retrograde, what can you expect? <laughs> yeah, it adds a nice ambience, that haunted, as we're talking about the haunted, yeah. things are becoming more haunted we've got the storm and the lightning i think it's perfect oh. and i'm in the dark now um <laughs> oh there you go we're all about that dark witchy aesthetic exactly i've got the dark aesthetic now so um we're normally i have a lot more bright light okay okay yeah so yes thank you eric let's be let's be i hope you enjoyed that interview with eric Addish, and i will put the details of how you can contact him and find him in the description field below if you liked the video, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe. I'm Sandra, and I'll see you on the next video. Blessed be.